Do I think that anti-Semitism is spiritual warfare? It's not, it's not only spiritual warfare, but it is definitely spiritual warfare. Um, Ezekiel 35 calls it the ancient hatred. Ancient hatred. And it's an ancient hatred of God's covenant people. See, you and I are here today as Christians because 3,500 years ago, God chose a man named Abraham in the Middle East and he revealed himself to him and said, I'm gonna bless you, and through your seed, or through your descendants, I'm gonna bless all the other nations and all the other families of the world. Well, we know that that happened because Messiah came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That was God's salvation plan. It wasn't that God loved Israel or loved the Jewish people more than he loves anybody else, but God needed a starting point. And his starting point was with a man named Abraham. And then he said, I'm gonna pass this promise to you, and to your son, and to your grandson, and to your descendants. So the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob became Israel, Israel, the descendants of that is the Jewish people. God's plan was always to create a nation that would serve the other nations as priests, and out of that nation would come his son who would save the world. And because of that, there's, that's really the birthplace of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism means hatred of the Jewish people. Revelation chapter 12, in the middle of the revelation, John the revelator gives this picture of a dragon. And the dragon is waiting for this woman who has 12 stars on her head and the moon and the star sun are there. And if you go back and look at jo Joseph's dream in Genesis, it's the same picture. It's talking about Israel. The woman is, tip of, is, is a type of Israel and she's about to give birth to a man-child, and it says that the dragon is waiting to devour the, the child when he is born, but, and, and the way that he assaults her is with a flood. So the, 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 the type in the picture is the dragon is Satan, the woman is Israel, who gave birth to the Messiah, and it says that not only does the dragon try to destroy her with a flood, but then he also turns and goes and attacks their other offspring, spiritual offspring, which is the church. Now here's what's interesting. It says that the dragon attacked the woman with a flood, flood of water, tried to drown her. When Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th last year, they named the operation the Al-Aqsa Flood because that's what they believed they were doing. They were flooding Israel to destroy the Jewish people and to reclaim Temple Mount. So it's, it's all rooted in anti-Semitism. And it goes, back to the, it goes back to the very beginning in Genesis 3.15. God made a promise to Eve. He said this. He said, I will put enmity or hostility between your seed, the seed of the woman, and the seed of the serpent. He says, he will... You will bruise his head, but he, or you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That is what's called in theological terminologies the proto evangelium, which means in Latin, the first mention of the gospel. God gave a promise that a seed was going to come into the earth that would destroy Satan and ultimately win back the world after the fall of man. Since that time, Satan has been attacking the seed of the woman, trying to figure out where the Messiah was going to come through. As soon as he identified it through the line of Abraham, he has spent history trying to destroy the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a, it's a spiritual battle against Jewish people. Now, there's political things that are implied. There's a lot of cultural things as well. It's not the only thing, but the root of it is definitely spiritual. So uh, I want to do this because I know you probably won't do it yourself, is you have a couple resources that I think maybe people know about this, but you've done an end times course. I think yes. it could be helpful. Um, on your website, uh, you can access that about... Uh, LeeCummings.com. I, I did an eight-week series on the end times, an hour long each session where I... What I just did here in like five minutes, I'd take eight hours to unpack. Yeah. And it's be great. And then uh, you release your new book, Why Israel Matters. Well, I thank you for mentioning yeah, that, I, Sean. I appreciate I that. I had that uh, uh, down I, right there. <laughs> I did, I, and I'm releasing it today. It's in the lobby at all of our locations. It's called Why Israel Matters. And I believe every Christian should read this book, and not because I wrote it, but I wrote it because I feel like every Christian should know 
uh, why Israel is significant and how to respond. Do we agree with everything that Israel, the secular nation, does? No. Uh, but is there spiritual significance and promises connected to Israel and the Jewish people? Yes. And is it going to become even more in the days and the months and the years ahead? Yes. How do we respond to that? Why is it important theologically, historically? How do we respond to that? And how do we respond to our friends? And listen, even major denominations and Christians who love Jesus have embraced something called replacement theology, which is that God's done with the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. And you and I now, as the church, we're the new spiritual Israel. And what that has led to throughout church history is persecution of the, of the Jewish people and, uh, and a lot of pain that has blocked them from hearing the gospel. When you see the cross, you see a symbol of sacrifice and salvation. When the Jewish people in Europe see the cross, they see forced conversion, persecution, and execution of Jewish people. Because that took place under the Spanish Inquisition. They were kicked out of England. They were kicked out of other European nations during the Crusades. They were rounded up, and, and many times they were killed or put in pogroms. And we know what happened in Germany, a Christian nation in the 30s and 40s. And so we've got a lot of work to, to do to undo that so that Romans 1.16 can take place, the gospel to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Because let me tell you something, Romans 9, 10, and 11 makes it very clear. God is not done with the Jewish people or the nation of Israel. All of Israel is going to be saved before Jesus returns. There's gonna be a massive revival that takes place in Israel during their most difficult hour. And if we embrace replacement theology that says, well, we're Israel, God doesn't care about them, we're gonna be offended and we're gonna be we're gonna be less than advocates for the people that God has all of his focus on at the end of the age, and we're gonna be thinking that it's about us.